Good afternoon. Please rise for the procession of the 2021 graduating class of Glendale Preparatory Academy. <laughs>
Please remain standing and join us in singing Gaudiamus Igitur. Please be seated. Good afternoon, parents of the graduates, family, and faculty, and those who are watching the live stream. Today, we are gathered to recognize and honor these graduates. They have successfully completed a rigorous course of study in the liberal arts over the last four years. And we, the assembled faculty of the academy, have come to confirm and endorse these young men and women as graduates, the class of 2021. Graduates, you are here, each of and every one of you, for worthily completing your studies, and I'd like to just recap what you've done over the last four years. Some of you have studied and completed two years of calculus, four years of a foreign language. All of you have sung in at least two choirs, performed in at least one play and one radio drama. You have read, annotated, and discussed over 25 novels, and the crowning achievement, you completed and defended your senior thesis, and this doesn't, uh, I'm not even listing the extracurricular activities you're involved in. These four years have not been easy, particularly the last two. There might have been moments where you found yourself looking ahead to what is next or what is to come rather than cherishing the present or the individuals before you every day. This particular class has a special place in my heart that I taught you in sixth grade, my first year at Glendale Prep. I have a framed photo of that matriculation uh, picture when I was yelling at all of you to get closer, get closer and then uh, that's in my office. So I want to take a little bit of time to just speak to you before we have uh, other speakers. And I'm going to bring you back to seventh grade uh, and a book that's no longer in, in our curriculum, Great Expectations. Many of you maybe a seventh grader said, oh, all I remember is that was really long. But let me see if I can bring you back. If you recall our impressionable orphan Pip returns from his very first visit at Miss Havisham's and reflects on the misery of his life a misery that was not familiar to him prior to his visit, a misery unseen and unfelt if one is blessed to have a caring companion like Joe Gardry, the blacksmith. We read the words of Pip after his visit. Quote, I set off for the four-mile walk to the forge, pondering as I went along on all I had seen and deeply revolving that I was a common laboring boy, that my hands were coarse, that my boots were thick, that I had fallen into a despic despicable habit of calling knaves jacks, that I was much more ignorant than I had considered myself last night, and generally that I was in a low-lived bad way. Pip worries he is too common. He wants his circumstances to change. Life is not what he expected. Pip is indeed common. It is common for each of us to forget the blessings in our lives when we find life is difficult, or we narrowly and thoughtlessly look ahead. We are like Pip in other ways. Each of you has great expectations. It can be difficult to maneuver and figure out life without a companion there by our side. We all need a Joe Gargery in our lives. Our friend, the blacksmith, provides words of wisdom that I want to share with you graduates. And these are Joe's words when he learns of Pip's dishonest account of what occurred at Satie's house and hearing Pip wish he was not common. Looky here, Pip, at what is said to, 
to you by a true friend, which is this to you the true friends say. If you can't get to be uncommon through going straight, you'll never get to doing it through going crooked. So don't tell no more lies, Pip, and live well and die happy. As we follow Pip through the years, he desperately seeks to be uncommon and does so often by not living well. In fact, Pip looks so much ahead of what will come, he not only forgets the individuals before him, but he grows ashamed of his very companion, Joe, and sends Joe away. When I read this story, I found myself too looking ahead to what will become of Pip and his great expectations. And I'm stunned at the end to find him in debtor's prison, ill with no hope in sight. And yet we're amazed and humbled to see who is by his side. Of course, there should be no doubt. There was Joe by his side. Joe was always there. In reading the story, we somehow forgot about the warm and inviting glow of the forge, the consistent sounding of the hammer, reminding us of the strength and steadfast commitment of our blacksmith. Pip seems to forget the love that was there before him the whole time, embodied in that person. We too can be like Pip. We can forget who is before us, who is with us, and focus more on what will come. Pip, as he awakes and sees Joe there, he cannot fathom the love and loyalty upon seeing him. Pip says, oh, Joe, you break my heart. Look angry at me, Joe. Strike me, Joe. Tell me of my ingratitude. Don't be so good to me. And what is Joe's response? Joe had actually laid his head down on the pillow at Pip's side and put his arm around Pip's neck for the joy that Pip knew him. You have great expectations. I think we can learn something from Joe's expectation. Joe found joy in simply simply being known by another, in being known by his dear old chap. Graduates, there's wisdom in looking ahead, in moving on from the past, not dwelling on the present, and considering the future. It is natural to look ahead. We would say that that's what maturity does. However, never look ahead without cherishing the present without cherishing the very souls who are right in front of you now. You were my first class at Glendale Prep. I know you, and I'm known by you. As the years go on and your shadows lengthen, I will always cherish the time we shared together. I have great expectations for each and every one of you, but I'll share just one. As you leave GP, find ways to truly know those who are with you and be truly known by them. Now, to begin our addresses this afternoon, the Academy has selected three graduates, two salutatorians and one valedictorian to speak on behalf of the senior class. Why two salutatorians? Well, we consider the academic achievement, as well as the virtue we've seen in both these young ladies. Each is humble, responsible, and genuinely cares for others. Both have contributed not only in the classroom, but but in our community through student life, extracurricular activities such as choir and drama. So we could not choose between them, as both exemplify excellence, so we'll have them both come up. Please welcome our 2021 salutatorians, Miss Molly Baird and Miss Rebecca Ong. (laughs) Students, family, friends, and faculty, Welcome to the graduation of the Glendale Preparatory Academy class of 2021. We are so (laughs) excited to be here together with all of you to celebrate this year's seniors. Before anything else, we have to recognize and thank the many individuals whose love and support got us to where we are today. Teachers, thank you for your genuine care as our well-being as students. Thank you for your passion for what we do and the countless hours of teaching and tutoring. Thank you for pushing us to do our best to challenge ourselves and to be outstanding young men and women in and out of the classroom. Thank you, family and friends, for being there for us through the highs and the lows, for being there during the breakdowns and the rants, for laughing together and being stressed together, for the hugs and the sincere care and the support. We wouldn't be here without you. Seniors, be proud of all the hard work you've done. We've studied calculus, we've learned foreign language, we've produced plays and practiced sports. 
We have not only survived, but we have thrived during this global pandemic. And we spent hundreds upon hundreds of hours having Socratic seminars near, nearly every day of school. We've journeyed through time and space with Meg in A Wrinkle in Time. We've witnessed the dystopian world of Fahrenheit 451 with Guy Montag. We've watched the ups and downs of the friendship between Reuben Malter and Danny Saunders in The Chosen. We've seen the tragic life of the great Jay Gatsby. We've survived the French Revolution as told in A Tale of Two Cities. We've debated whether Achilles, Hector, and Odysseus are heroes in the Iliad and the Odyssey, the epic Greek tales of the Trojan War and beyond. We have journeyed through the depths of hell with Dante and the Divine Comedy. But beyond just talking about academic accomplishments, when we were considering what to say today, we decided to take a page from the brothers Karamazov, literally, and give a speech inspired by Alyosha's final speech at The Rock. You must know, Alyosha says, that there is nothing higher or stronger, or sounder, or more useful afterwards in life than some good memory. Now our class has so many good memories together, and there are so many that we could talk about and that we wanted to talk about. We have only so much time, so we picked a few to reminisce about with you all today. Like in sixth grade, American history with Ms. Roiger reenacting Gettysburg and other battles in the classroom and on the field. And remember seventh grade with Mr. Fuller? We did so many wild things, like constantly singing about pine trees. And there was art class with Mr. Collum. We worked on darkening the outline and adding shading while listening to classical music every day, like Ride of the Valkyries on Wagner Wednesday or Step It Up Mary on Free For All Friday. What is most unique about this class is the history of firsts we've created at GP. Our junior year would have a spring break that went on forever. Some might even say it went right into summer break. And who else can say that they traded their senior trip to Washington, D.C. for a snowy survival trip in the absolutely freezing weather where we looked at the white abyss called the Grand Canyon and where Jacob Johnson dominated the dance floor in somebody else's wheelchair. <laughs> we could go on forever about these moments, some that make us cringe, some that make us laugh until our sides hurt and we will carry them with us wherever we will go, for it is a mosaic of all these moments that create our memory. What is the purpose of a memory? A memory is a system or process that stores what we learn for future use. Alyosha takes it even further, quote, even if only one good memory remains with us in our hearts, that alone may serve someday for our salvation, end quote. Might we suggest what that one good salvation-serving memory could be from our years at GP? For most of us, it is a memory perhaps not yet recognized because we have not had to face life without it yet, the memory of true friendship. Above fact memorizing, problem solving, test taking, and method practicing, let us remember the stalwart character that was constantly encouraging us at our time at GP. Wonderful life lessons that are so needed in today's world. The art of listening to both sides, the courage to show respect, the inspiration we receive from someone we have little in common with, the joy of celebrating one another's accomplishments. The chance we had to embolden others who at times felt like they were standing outside the circle. What it means to be human. What real justice, virtue, truth, goodness, and beauty are. As we go our different directions, let us take with us everything we have been taught. Let us remember the true friends and advocates we have been so fortunate to have in our most formable years. If we continue to embody these values, we will indeed make a vital difference in so many lives, and in turn, we will change the world. In just a short time, we'll be walking across this stage, receiving our high school diplomas and closing the chapter of our high school years. Remember this moment, relish it, cherish it, add it to the mosaic of moments that you already are made of, and keep adding to it in the years to come as you go forward in life. And once again, we are taking from Dostoevsky to tell you, let us first of all and before all be kind, then honest, and then let us never forget one another. Well, let's go. And we go like this now, hand in hand. And eternally so, all our lives hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you, Molly and Rebecca, for your thoughtful words and the joy you brought to your classmates and teachers each day you were on campus. There's only one recipient for the 
Academy's highest honor of valedictorian. This young lady is an outstanding model of noble character, academic excellence, and intellectual humility. She works tirelessly in her preparation and exercises a relentless sense of wonder. She earned perfect marks for all four years of high school. I am pleased to present to you our valedictorian of the class of 2021, Ms. Kieran Wasco. Students, faculty, we are gathered here today to celebrate the accomplishment of the senior class of 2021. As you all likely know, the purpose of a valedictorian speech is to give the final goodbye. Goodbyes are nothing new. We've said goodbye an unthinkable number of time over the past seven years. We've hastily said it to our friends as we've rushed off to calc class. We've given goodbye hugs at the end of particularly rough school days. And at the end of every year, we've written in people's yearbooks, we should definitely hang out over the summer, with the mutual understanding that we will probably not be seeing each other again until August. <laughs> Yet this goodbye is different. This will likely be the last time all of us will be in the same room together. So look around at the faces you've been seeing for the past seven years. We're at a strange point in our lives where we can look at our friends and see both their current blooming youth and the shy little fifth graders they were when we met them. We've been blessed with the gift of growing together and getting to witness the process by which the people around us became who they are today. Though we may not be gathered in person again, we will still continue to grow and change together. In three years, you may be in California or Chile or even across the world, but you will still share a connection with the people in this room. And what is this connection? It is nothing other than the elevation of thought which we achieve through collaboration with each other. This school, rigorous and challenging as it may be, has given us the tools we can use to improve ourselves. Over the past seven years, we've challenged each other's ideas at the seminar. We've been pushed, sometimes unwillingly, to grow beyond what we once thought ourselves capable of. Everyone in this room has developed the ability to think and understand things for themselves. I do not think you will understand what an accomplishment that is until you interact with people who are not fortunate enough to receive our education. But beware. This level of awareness comes with a price. Sometime over the course of the next few years, you may feel isolated when your free thought distinguishes you from your peers. You may feel the longing to be back with the others within the cave of ignorance, not because you think they're right, but because you're just so tired of feeling alone. At times like these, I urge you to pause for a moment. At the peak of your loneliness, I urge you to remember the faces in this room and remember that with them, somewhere in the world, there are others who are sharing in your struggle. It will be difficult, but let your memory of these people bring you comfort. Let each face be a reminder that humans are still capable of creativity, lofty contemplation, and genuine love for each other. If this past year has taught us anything, it's that we cannot predict what the future holds. But at the same time, the very fact that we are all still here together carries its own lesson. We are far sturdier than any of us thought we would be. So, as you stand at this threshold, you may begin to grow overwhelmed contemplating future hardships and worrying about things which haven't happened yet. It's natural, but I think you should give yourself some more credit. Take confidence in your own resilience, but also take heart in the fact that, because of the bond you share with the people in this room, you will never truly be alone. There is hope in the world, even if we have to make it for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran, for your considered address and how you exemplified for all of us serious inquiry and exploration for the sake of knowledge and beauty. And I appreciate the reminder 
to remember the time we shared together, remember the faces sitting next to you. Graduates, to send you forth, the Academy has invited Mr. Eric Twist. Mr. Twist has been with Great Heart since 2008, when he wisely left his role as assistant principal of Basis Scottsdale to serve as the dean of students at Veritas Prep while teaching seventh grade lit comp, eighth grade medieval history, and ninth grade humane letters. From there, he went on to be the founding headmaster of Archway Veritas, after which he oversaw our K through five expansion across the state of Arizona, then becoming the head of external affairs and for the past three years serving as president of Great Hearts Arizona. Outside of Great Hearts, Mr. Twist recently completed five years on the state board for charter schools and is currently serving on the board of the Arizona Charter School Association. Additionally, Mr. Twist has founded a nonprofit organization dedicated to local intellectual and aesthetic enrichment here in Phoenix, helped start a publishing company focused on liturgical traditionalism within the Catholic Church, and most recently has been part of a new restaurant venture, Valentine, near the corner of Indian School and 7th Ave, which he thinks you all should try. Uh, that's actually where I got you the gift card for, for doing this. All right. Mr. Twist earned degrees from Trinity University in San Antonio and the University of Oxford in England. He and his wife, Allison, uh, have six children, all boys, and they all attend Veritas. Please welcome Mr. Eric Twist. Thank you, Mr. Navarrete. It is uh, an honor to be invited to dress you this afternoon. Uh, before I begin, let me just take a moment to share my gratitude for the men and women who make Glendale Prep one of the premier prep schools in the country today. You graduates may not realize it, I hope you do, I think you do, but you have been under the care of some of the brightest and most honorable faculty and staff you are likely to ever come across again. Not only do they know their stuff, and they know a lot of it, but they understand that education is first an act of love. And that love they have shown you isn't the cheap sentimental stuff peddled by the world, but a love rooted in truth and the understanding that for any of you to find happiness, you must first find virtue. And let me tell you, that is a rare thing among educators today. It is a joy to stand with them here, and I can only hope to honor all the toil and faith they have been putting into serving your young but eternally significant souls these past few years, especially this year. Especially this year. Let's take a moment to thank them now, shall we? So it is not lost on me how loathsome commencement addresses can be. Uh, we haven't experienced any yet, but just wait. Just hold on. Especially from some charter school administrator you've never met. Oh, the horror. I want you to know that I wrote this address, though, not as an administrator, but as a father. I had my own kids in mind. While I don't have a graduate this year, I will next. My oldest, Carter, will be finishing his last year at Veritas, and I thought about him and his brothers, and I thought about you all when preparing these remarks. And uh, at the risk of going full great hearts on you, I have decided to anchor this address to a poem, one of my favorite poems, Sonnet Number 10 from Huntsman What Quarry by Edna St. Vincent Millay. I want to take you through it with some quick reflections. It gets a little dark, a little bit dark, but then every great heart senior is sent off into a world of some darkness and called to be a light and a hope within it, to not fall for the lies of the age, but to have the courage to stand up for what is, yes, you have heard it a million times, what is true and good and beautiful. I promise to not let this drag on, at least not, it'll drag on a little bit, but you'll be okay. But let's hear the poem first. Upon this age that never speaks its mind, 
this furtive age, this age endowed with power, to wake the moon with footsteps, fit an oar into the rowlocks of the wind and find what swims before his prow, what swirls behind. Upon this gifted age, in its dark hour, rains from the sky a meteoric shower of facts. They lie unquestioned, uncombined, Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun, but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. Undefiled precedes pure science and has her say, but still upon this world from the collective womb is spewed all day the red triumphant child. Millay wrote this sonnet just before or close to the beginning of 1939 when Huntsman What Quarry was first published. A consequential year amidst a larger consequential time if there ever was one. As she wrote the sonnet, she did not know what you now know, that by September of that year, the world would be thrust back into war with Germany invading Poland. Nearly 85 million people would perish between the fall of 39 and the summer of 45. That's almost three times the population of our city slaughtered every year for six straight years. It was indeed an age endowed with power, an age fascinated with its own genius, an age of men seeking the utopic visions, their utopic visions, with all the tyrannical mania of minor gods. You could see it brewing at the turn of the century. The old institutions were fading. There was no trust in the ancient pieties and the old dogmas anymore. This, this was the age of the nation state. The age where mankind could finally put all the faculties of its technological and rationalist dreams into the service of a perfected society. And in a prophetic tone, an age just 30 years on from the publication of the sonnet would indeed wake the moon with footsteps. A gifted age, a gifted age. However, in its dark hour. But why dark? What happened? Raining from the sky is a meteoric shower of facts. That's probably truer for you now than it was even for Malay. New discoveries, new information, the genius of mankind on display at every turn, new facts, better facts. But those facts lie unquestioned, she writes. Of course, why question the thing that endows you with power? Here we have wisdom enough, enough wisdom at our disposal to rid us of our ills, Malay states, and yet for all the knowledge, something is missing. There seems to be no shortage of fancy ideas, big ideas, promising to take all the new facts and make a better world from them. However, the truth that ties it all into a meaningful thread, Malay says, is missing. We, it seems, for all of our power, for all of our growing knowledge, can still miss something. And here may be the first lesson. Be suspicious in this next season of your life of those who would dazzle you with fancy ideas, with the new facts. Be suspicious of visions of grandeur and utopias. Be suspicious not only because there are no fancy ideas. There is nothing new under the sun. Everything is repackaged. Those visions and those utopias, especially the ones university professors seem to be quite fond of, have been peddled before. But be suspicious also because the fanciful things are all too often a mile wide in their promises, 
and an inch deep in their substance. And they will always fail you. And be suspicious, especially suspicious, of those ideas that tempt you to put on a kind of cultural piety, particularly a piety that is nothing more than a devotion to criticism. It is easy to criticize what has come before you. It's the only thing, by the way, universities tend to do any longer. This is not to say, of course, that you should avoid criticism. Certainly not. Lord knows there is plenty in the world worthy of it. I'm engaging in a bit of it right now, if you haven't noticed. But be suspicious of those who only criticize. They lay traps for young minds, and some never escape. In this vein, before we look at the end of the sonnet, let me go back to the beginning really quickly. Malay says at the opening of the sonnet that it was an age that never speaks its mind. Here, I think, is yet another lesson. Well, simply put, speak your mind and be sure it is yours. Consider how easy it is for all of us to want to hide within the zeitgeist, within the spirit of the age, to let our thoughts and our words conform to the dominant narrative. Now, to be fair, don't simply dismiss the dominant narrative because it is dominant. Assume those around you believe the things they do because they see truth in them. Contend with what is before you. But likewise, don't play the cowardly chameleon who blends in in order to not cause any trouble, to just get on, to hide, to fit in. We all know there was plenty of that in the 1930s, as Millay rightly observes. One thing for each of you to consider might be this. If your worldview becomes nothing more than a reflection of those with all the cultural power and status. If your opinions are the ones that you hear proclaimed almost in unison by every Hollywood elite, every 20-something pop star, nearly all those enlightened CEOs and tenured professors, the government bureaucrats of 30 years, the TikTok philosophers, and maybe everyone playing for, say, I don't know, the LA Lakers, maybe, Just maybe it might be worth considering an alternative perspective. Maybe they have it all right. Maybe they've figured it all out. But maybe they are missing something. Maybe they are missing something. Speaking your mind is difficult because it levies upon you the responsibility to first think clearly with the truth as your aim not simply conformity to the ideologies that protect you by fitting in. Malay spoke her mind, and at great cost sometimes. And this takes us to the end of her poem. Undefiled, she writes, precedes pure science and has her say, but still upon this world from the collective womb is spewed all day the red, triumphant child. Malay saw better than most the reality that knowledge untethered from virtue is a cruel friend. She also saw that no matter how much we have advanced as a people, we are still very much prone to holding on to very bad ideas. The intellectual elite of her time were prone to romantic visions of a collectivist paradise, which is to say, they made it quite fashionable to wax poetic on the strengths of Marxism. Millay didn't buy it. What she saw coming forth from the collective womb was the triumphalism of the communist state, a triumphalism riddled with genocide oppression, and the utter loss of the dignity of the individual. And for dissenting against the fashionable thinking of the time, she was vilified. Unfortunately, for us, 
fashions tend to return. And somehow, like mom jeans, we cannot shake Marxism. It's cool again, just with a slightly different twist. Please, please, as you head into your 20s, push back against the temptation to accept the retribalization of society. Push back against the idea that everything is a dichotomy of oppressor and oppressed. Then that everything can be reduced to power. It can't, and thank God. Those that have pushed these ideas in the past have done some of the most horrific things. Remember that. Don't forget it. Listen to Malay and question the so-called facts that are raining down upon you. And remember something. Remember, there is so much to be grateful for. There are so many good people in the world so many things worth living for and protecting. So many things to devote your life to, to go and build. Beautiful and noble things worthy of your efforts. Friendship built, friendships built around virtue and the pursuit of what is good. Marriages anchored to true love. The giving away of yourself for the sake of the other. Children raised to know what is good and how to love. Families that exude joy and devotion and trust. You can be a part of it all. Remember, there is so much promise and possibility before you. And remember that gratitude for the good things that surround you is an essential part of avoiding the cynicisms that plague so many. Remember that there is more good going on in everyday life than can even be accounted for. And remember Glendale Prep. Remember the simpler days when pursuing what was true and good and beautiful was as easy as opening a book and starting a conversation. And remember the teachers and the staff who made those conversations possible. Remember what they've done to provide you one of the finest educations that exists in the world today. The men and women here before you are living proof that life is full of blessings, more than we could ever deserve. God bless you as you go, and know that you are loved. Thank you, Mr. Twist, for your inspirational words and reminding us of the right path to avoid the fashionable at ex the expense of the truth. Uh, I've been blessed and encouraged by your friendship over the years, so thank you. We now come to the central moment of the afternoon in which the Academy will grant diplomas to the class of 2021. I have asked our wonderful and beloved Mrs. Sarbacher our assistant headmaster to come to the podium and call the roll of the graduates. I'll also ask Mr. Fuller and Ms. Reuter to come and help with the diplomas.
graduates, as your names are called, please come to the stage to pick up your diploma. Gavin Abeku Akins. Audrey Kirsten Alcantara. Madison May Allen. Arlen Bryden Alter. Ryan Glenn Anderson. Isabella Sophia Ayer. <laughs> Molly Marie Baird. <laughs> Brian Zachary Beachy. Madison Faye Bell. <laughs> Alexis Isabella Bridges. <laughs> Caleb James Brown. Gile Aiden Brucker. <laughs> Patricia Francis Margaret Val Buckley. <laughs> Ryan Joshua Byrne. Monica Livia Chang. <laughs> Marin Grace Clark. <laughs> Rose Marie Klaus. Alana Isabella Costina. <laughs> Ryan Patrick Cullum. <laughs> Christopher George Curran. Jaslyn Simone Damasco. <laughs> Anthony Michael Gaza de la Cruz. <laughs> Michaelin Christine Gaza de la Cruz. Samantha Marie Gaza de la Cruz. <laughs> Xander Donald Dumichel Jones. <laughs> Ruby K. 
Karen Ellis. Isabella Maria Ferris. <laughs> Madeline Grace Foreman. <laughs> Gianna Nicole Giambrone. Brighton Elizabeth Greathouse. <laughs> Ethan Kapali Kapua Kovai Ola Heptig. Gia Sophia Harold. <laughs> Serenity Faith Hoffman. <laughs> Rachel Elizabeth Howell. Jeffrey Todd Jansen. <laughs> Dylan Scott Johnson. <laughs> Jacob Tyler Johnson. Shatrali Mahesh Kambli. Arbella Sarah Kasim. Lauren Grace Kawashima. Remini Rose Kinman. <laughs> Isabella Joy Klein. <laughs> Jonathan Andrew Kraus. Christy Shailesh Lolam. <laughs> Emma Sofa Mahoney. Sophie Mahoney. <laughs> Nicholas Alexander Martell. Sarah Elizabeth Miles. <laughs> Zoe Bella Nichols. <laughs> Aiden Thomas O'Meara. Dylan Z. Ogle. <laughs> Rebecca Elizabeth Ong. <laughs> D. 
Dami Lola, Dola Simi, Adeneke East Esther Oliakin. Abigail Reese Palabinskas. Lexi Hanna Pratt. Alexandria Christina Robinson. Lola Renee Rougemont. Rachel Elizabeth Schmidt. Camille Christine Schofield. Sarah Emily Scheidelman. Seth Thomas Storino. Austin Michael Thorpe. Libby Juliet Trimble. Kieran Hannah Demetria Wasco. Nathaniel Allen Whiting. <laughs> Madeline Air Wiest. Drake Owen Wilson. <laughs> Madison Mailing Winkleblech. Graduates, please move the tassels on your caps from the right to the left. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with us in honoring these graduates of Glendale Preparatory Academy, the class of 2021. Please be seated. Graduates, to send you forth, the Academy has invited one of our own, our beloved Mr. Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez models what it is to know and love students. He emanates excitement and care for each of you. I will forever cherish the years he served at GP as a sixth grade science teacher, ninth and twelfth grade humane letters teacher, eleventh and twelfth grade Greek teacher, the years of coaching and most recently as the best commentator on the best sports network ever, the Griffin Sports Net. He is humbled and honored to send you off. Please show your gratitude and love as you welcome Mr. Gonzalez. Isn't it amazing that we can understand each other? 
was the very first words that I heard from Brother Raphael from my undergrad liberal arts program. And I think they apply to this last day of your high school liberal arts uh, experience. I'll never forget that question. Isn't it amazing we can understand each other? You wonder-filled graduates. I had no idea what Brother Raphael could have meant because I had not yet engaged in the kind of discussions that you yourselves have engaged in all these years. After your four years at Glendale Prep, after those countless seminar hours, after experiencing the amazement of wonder, and now sitting here listening to my words, I think you can begin to understand what Bra Brother Raphael meant and what we can take from it. First off, it's the shortest word that causes me the most reflection. We, you and I, we are having this understanding right now. This momentary, one-sided conversation. And although we can converse with ourselves, whether aloud or in silence, I think the magic of a conversation is too unpredictable to anticipate alone. Can you remember all the times in class where the conversation took a wild turn? After all, could we even do what we do at Glendale Prep if not together? I have no doubts someone can investigate truth, beauty, goodness alone. But I don't know if that same person would truly understand the human realities that we share uh, amongst each other and with other humans. Would that person know how to disagree with respect? Would that person know how to understand the other human person in the conversation? There's certainly an irony that most of our conversations are about stories or fictional characters, but that doesn't prevent us from recognizing humanity within everything we read. As humans, we have this unique capability to interpret meaning from small marks to read, as we've come to call it. And then on top of that, we can make the right noises to share an intangible reality of our mind, a single idea. That recursive loop makes a conversation. Isn't that amazing? But why even have those conversations in the first place? Why did I switch majors from biochemistry to liberal arts? Why are you sitting here today instead of graduating a week ago from another school? Maybe you didn't have a choice in the matter. But I suspect it's because of the relationships you've built over the years through conversation. When I was a college freshman studying chemistry and more calculus, I'd end my days talking about Homer and Plato with my liberal arts roommate. It was those human conversations that drove me to take a chance to switch majors and with luck to meet people like Brother Raphael, to be hired by Glendale Prep, and to be blessed to spend this past year with all of you. He and I still talk over the last decade, and I was his best man just a few years ago. Over the years, what conversations with your peers have remained with you? What conversations with your teachers? What conversations with the younger students, quite literally looking up to some of you? Each of those conversations was a choice on your part. You made a decision to speak and think with another human. And Glendale Prep has strived to prepare you to develop your ability to speak, read, and think well. We want you to be able to make yourself understood while also being capable of understanding others. We want you to grow those necessary human skills to be, to be free to live your life as you want it, to figure it out on your own terms. I bet you've been asked far too many times, what do you want to do after high school? What do you want to do with life? Trust me, I had no idea when I was 18. I still struggle to figure it out at 29. What I do know is that understanding is possible. Problems can be solved, and genuine human connection can exist and is within your capabilities to do so. Whether you want to pursue nursing, computer science, astronomy, veterinary work, psychology, engineering, political science, graphic design and art, start your own business, or navigate any other line of trade or study, know that all these years studying the classical texts have not gone to waste. 
everything we do in life requires us to express ourselves through some medium and our ability to speak, read, write, and most importantly, to think well. These all function as the basis for that human expression. The goal of Glendale Prep has never been to create classicists, but to prepare humans for life, both in minds and in hearts. Isn't it amazing that we can understand each other? I'll never forget that question. I'll never forget your class of 2021. I urge you never to forget each other. The time we spend together as humans in good conversation is some of the most precious time we could ever have. Think back about all the conversations you had during school, before class, during HL break, during Lyceum, in the cafeteria, in the Grand Canyon, up in the trees of Flagstaff, in the snow of Williams, and just before now, when you, before you walked in here to sit and graduate. Just as we ended in humane letters, I want to end with Dostoevsky, with Alyosha's words. You must know there is nothing higher and stronger and more wholesome and good for life in the future than some good memory, especially a memory of childhood, of home. People talk to you a great deal about your education, but some good, sacred memory preserved from childhood is perhaps the best education. Thank you for all the good conversations and memories, and good luck, class of 2021. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. You have always modeled genuine care and enthusiasm, and while you will not be with us next year, I know that you will always be a Griffin. At the conclusion of the award ceremony yesterday morning, the entire student body joined to sing the school song, The Minstrel Boy. As our seniors recess from their final assembly, they sing the first stanza, and then they leave, and then the student body sings the remainder. Now the graduating class of 2021 will stand and sing the school song as their final farewell to Glendale Preparatory Academy. Parents and family, please stand for the recessional. Congratulations to the class of 2021. Good afternoon and farewell. <laughs>